So, how does international governance work in an anarchic environment? We see that countries do exist in a system of global governance because there's lots of international institutions that regulate state behavior on cross-border issues to bring stability and harmony to the international system. But we still live in anarchy. And this is a visual demonstration of actually how international governance works in anarchy. I apologize for the fact that this image isn't very clear, um, but I'll just try and explain to you exactly what is happening. So here we have cross-border issues. We have like climate change, financial crises, terrorism, travel, refugees, all of these issues cross borders. You then have states and states want to solve some of these problems that are global. So what they do is they then create international organizations to solve cross border problems through international law. These are the international institutions. So UN, World Trade Organization, International Atomic Energy Agency, the World Bank, the ICC, um, the UNHCR, which deals with refugees. Um, this deals with air travel and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They then have some functions to help solve these problems. They regulate behavior, they provide information, they punish states, they mediate and settle disputes, they provide financial assistance. And these functions help countries work together and trust each other. Now, so in ways, the global governance, it exists above states because they do these functions. But the key thing is that these international institutions depends on powerful states to provide finance, diplomatic support, and also provide staff. So this kind of, these circles represent like the power of the countries. They still have a lot of power over international institutions. So if the UN makes a critical report about the US policy in Iraq, like for example, the UN says, uh, accuses the US of committing torture. The US can just withdraw support from the UN. It can restrict finance to the UN. The UN can't really do anything because these international institutions, they exist also under states as well. So they exist above it in terms of providing oversights, but they also are answerable to these states. So we still live in a system of power, but there is networks of global governance. Now I wanna move specifically to global cooperation pandemic because it's really relevant at the moment and specifically the geopolitics of COVID-19. Some global institutions provide information and expertise. So as I said here, um, they provide information. Now, what they do is, Institutions like the World Health Organization and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they employ people from across the world who are experts in these global issues. So that when governments experience problems with these issues, whether it's climate change or disease, they can go to the World Health Organization or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and ask for advice. How should we deal with this situation? What's our strategy? So this is the case with the World Health Organization. It's responsible for global public health. That's the cross-border problem, stopping the spread of diseases, improving health among all people. And it provides advice and technical assistance to governments. So if a country in Africa or Europe, like Italy, for example, um, they're having problems with the coronavirus, they don't have a effective strategy. They would talk to the WHO and the WHO would then tell them about standards and guidelines for dealing with diseases and epidemics um, and pandemics. They would provide advice and strategies to deal with it. For example, aggressive testing at the very beginning or social distancing or um, contact tracing. Um, tell them about what vaccines are available. They also have resources and data, so there's lots of information that they can provide to governments that are relevant for dealing with these crises. And they could also be a place where countries come together to coordinate responses on how to deal with the issue. 
for example, China and the US, even though they're not cooperating at the moment, if they combine their resources to to find a vaccine for the coronavirus, this would be this would be solved much quicker. And they could do this through the World Health Organization by meeting uh, within this forum. Now, I'll give you, I'll show you a video here where you can see what kind of expertise the World Health Organization can provide. So this is a video of the leader or the head of the WHO giving really good advice and strong advice for what governments should be doing in response to this pandemic. So this is the type of advice and information that global institutions can provide to countries dealing with these type of cross-border problems like disease. Now, the very final part of this lecture is the geopolitics of COVID-19. Um, the outbreak of COVID-19 is an opportunity for China to position itself as a global leader at the expense of the United States. I say this because China is taking the lead in terms of how to deal with this crisis, and it is providing assistance to countries across the world. It is positioning itself as a global leader um, so that in, in pandemic response to the two key narratives is China is the model for reducing the spread of virus. So even though the virus um, started in China, it's China effectively tackled the coronavirus. Now, it's questionable how many new cases there are, um, but China has drastically reduced the number of infections. And it, it is promoting itself as a global leader in terms of using the Chinese model to solve the problem, which is like mass quarantining, uh, shutting down business, shutting down entire cities, uh, for two weeks and then you can start addressing the problem. It is also a leader in terms of providing material assistance to the world. Now, it is selling these, not it's not donating them, but it is providing much needed equipments like ventilators, masks, respirators and medicines to highly impacted countries like Italy and Iran. And China has the advantage because most of these products are actually made in China. The US is not a leader in this at all. And the US can't even deal with the virus domestically, let alone internationally. So on the key issue of our generation, the corona, the spread of this pandemic, China is taking the lead. And this is just a quick video just showing you how China is manufacturing them and also selling them to the rest of the world. Okay, so when we speak about power, it's not just about economic and military power. It relates to what we've discussed today. It is also about soft power, like diplomacy, international institutions, uh, working with other countries. And 
the perception of leadership is really important. So in order to understand what I'm going to say here, there's a few key concepts that you need to know. Le legitimacy. Legitimacy means public faith in leadership. And global legitimacy would be countries widely accept the leadership role of a particular country. The way that you get global legitimacy is if your country provides global public goods. So global public goods are issues that are important to and benefit all countries that are integrated into globalization. So if your country takes a leadership role in providing peace and security, a clean environment, global public health, global rules, you know, facilitating international trade, and investment in infrastructure to facilitate globalization, other countries will look to you and say, okay, I accept that you are a leader, we're going to listen to you, you're going to have huge influence over the global system. Now, for 70 years, the US was the provider of these public goods. Not necessarily a clean environment, but the US has provided security to Europe and to Asia. It took the lead in terms of creating global rules through the creation of the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the International Monetary Funds, and also investment in infrastructure. The US for decades was the main investor and was a creator for the infrastructure facilitating globalization. The United States used to be better at providing these things in the world. But since Trump in particular, and Trump's America first policy, the US is withdrawing as a leader of this global system. And China is gaining increasing legitimacy as a global leader providing global public goods. For instance, for the coronavirus, China is being very aggressive and active in terms of promoting itself as being the leader in terms of a model, as I said, but also in terms of helping other countries uh, with vital equipment. So does 2020 herald the beginning of a China as a global leader? There's a lot of signs saying yes. Um, in terms of economic leadership, it has created the Belt and Road Initiative, which we spoke about a few weeks ago. Uh, so a huge investment and in infrastructure project across the Eurasian continent and Africa and the Middle East. It is increasingly a global military power, not just in Asia, but also spreading into the Indian Ocean. And also diplomatic leadership on the key issue of our generation, the coronavirus. Okay, and that's it. That's the end of the lecture.